Okay, well, I'd like to welcome everybody to this symposium this afternoon. We're here to celebrate 40 years of applied math and computational sciences at the DOE labs. And in particular, we are celebrating the career of David Brown. And so um, very pleased to see so many folks have been able to turn out. We also have a number of folks who are online uh, who will have been able to join us uh, virtually. Okay, so let me take a moment to introduce Mike Witherall. He is the lab director for Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And again, he has prepared a, a short uh, set of welcoming remarks for the symposium. And hopefully this will all go well and it'll be shared and also audible here in the room. One thing I wanna make sure, sorry. Thank you very much, Lori. Hello, and welcome to this symposium celebrating the storied past of applied mathematics and computational science at the DOE labs and of the extraordinary people who made this possible. I want to welcome some special guests, some of whom have not been able to visit Berkeley for some time. Steve Binkley, Principal Deputy Director in the Office of Science, Barb Helen, Associate Director for OSCAR, Steve Ashby, my colleague as Director of PNNL, Kathy Yellick, the current Vice Chancellor of Research at UC Berkeley and former ALD for Computing Sciences here, and Horst Simon, who is currently the Division Director for OSCAR's Advanced Computing Technology and who, of course, was Deputy Director for Research and CRO here after being ALD. It's great to get the band back together. Today, Berkeley Lab researchers are accelerating scientific discovery through applied mathematics and computational science in every area of research pursued at the laboratory. And David Brown has been driving that transformation as our division director for computational research for the last decade, as he did in his 27 years at Los Alamos in Livermore. His attention to the increasing importance of data intensive science and to connecting with other scientific divisions played a central role in making Berkeley Lab become so successful in interdisciplinary computational science. He has also been an exemplary leader, taking responsibility for the people in his division, as well as for the research. And he's always great to work with, a model of what a division director should be. Now I'll turn it back to Lori. I hope you enjoy this symposium. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lori Dyson. I'm at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. I have worked uh, with David since about the year 2000. Um, when he was, um, when I was first at Argonne, uh, I then moved to Lawrence Livermore National Lab where I worked with David and I've continued to work with him even, uh, even though he since abandoned us and came over here to, to Berkeley National Lab. And so I, I know David well, and I'm very, very honored to uh, be able to MC the event today. And today we're going to take you through a retrospective in the form of four panels. And so we decided to go ahead and divide the panels into basically the early years. So David's time at Los Alamos National Lab and Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And we have a number of folks who are um, keyed up to speak in that area and tell you a little bit about what was going on in applied math at that time, what some of the legacy is, how David has impacted that legacy. Um, then we're going to turn it over to the, to the DOE Computational Graduate Science Fellowship, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Take a, take a break um, so we can go out, have a glass of water, some coffee, come back, talk, talk about his interactions across DOE with the, other, with the other laboratories, with the OSCAR program. And then we'll conclude with the last decade of work that he's done here at Berkeley National Lab. Um, with, and then final remarks from David. So just a real quick primer for those who are not familiar with, with the DOE system. So, so the DOE runs a pretty large number of national laboratories. So the DOE Office of Science runs 17 labs, one of which is Berkeley National Lab, which is just up, up the hill here. Uh, the DOE National Nuclear Security Administration, which is focused in on you know, nuclear weapons and ensuring the stockpile is safe and secure, manages three national labs, two of which David worked at, uh, Los Alamos National Lab in New Mexico and Lawrence Livermore, which is about 45 miles to the east in, in Livermore, California. So, so those are the three national labs that will be represented today. 
The um, OSCAR is a program at DOE's Office of Science. It's the Advanced Scientific Computing Research Program uh, that is led by Barb Helen now. This program is, uh, was previously uh, MIX, and I don't even at this point remember what that stands for, mathematical and engineering. So, um, and you know, David has been very instrumental and has interacted with the Oscar program over many, many years. And so we'll hear about some of those interactions and the influence that he's had on computational mathematics in particular, uh, and how that has changed and evolved over the years to, to uh, become more representative of things like data sciences and ensuring that the future of computational science is strong. And then finally, the Computational Science Graduate Fellowship Program is a, it's a highly competitive, uh, nationally competed program for graduate students uh, that was started in, in the early 90s. David was one of the you know, founding uh, steering committee members and one of the early um, you know, advocates for that program and has been involved basically since the early 90s until now, very actively involved in that pro uh, program. So we wanted to highlight these particular aspects of David's career and, and the influence that he's had in those areas. So this is what you'll hear about today. Um, this is just a you know, timeline of a few major activities. Uh, you know, he was at Los Alamos from 84 to 98, and then Livermore from 98 to 2011, and Berkeley from 2011 to, to today. I have not uh, shared this slide with David. So David, I apologize if anything's incorrect here. Um, numerical methods research uh, from Caltech uh, into the Overture project, which has been a landmark piece of software for, for many, many decades. And we'll hear about that a little bit later. And then his leadership in the SIDAC uh, program, which, which I can certainly talk about and many others can talk about as well. He started his Oscar interactions at, at Los Alamos as the applied math point of contact. And that continued at Livermore and continues today uh, with, with his interactions as the primary points of contact, point of contact for Oscar at, at Berkeley. And there are a number of very high visible reports and activities that he's been involved with that, that we'll talk about a little bit today. Uh, and then the CSGF program, as I mentioned, you know, he was a founding member back in 1991 and he's continued that through all of his interactions um, at the various different laboratories We'll also hear a little bit about something called the CRLC, the uh, Computational Research Leadership Council, of which David was a founding member. Uh, and he's also been active in other areas that, for our community, the Siam Science uh, Council on Science Policy, and many other areas. But to start, we thought it would be fun <laughs> for, for, to play a little game today. So I challenge this room to think about what is it that David is thinking about or who is David thinking about <laughs> as he's repeatedly smashing this weighted ball into the concrete sidewalk over and over and over again. <laughs> so that's your challenge. There are index cards that, that are available out on the break. Um, uh, there's a bowl out there. We'll do this anonymously. So, you know, go ahead and be frank. And then we'll go ahead and you read those answers out at the end of the day or, or during the reception or dinner. So I do wanna thank John Basher for providing us with this lovely, lovely film so that we can make a fun movie. <laughs> so with that, I'll conclude the, the opening remarks. Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you wanted to see it again. <laughs> So we'll, we'll go to our first panel. And so um, I was fortunate that we were able to collect a you know, pretty wide variety of pictures from, from over the years of David's career at the various different national laboratories and in various different settings. I will say that um, as I was putting these slides together, I realized that in many of these photos, we're seeing David in, you know, in his youth, right? In younger days. And so to be kind to our panelists, many of whom are you know, luminaries in the field and have been in our field for quite a while. I decided to go ahead and also select pictures from our youth um, to the extent that I could find them. So for all of our panelists, I've tried to find a picture that's at least 10 years out of date. And so, so that's, that is my um, way of saying thank you for being here. 
uh, because those pictures will be up behind you as you're talking if you're not presenting slides. All right, so I'd like to invite our first uh, set of panelists who are here to come on down to the front. So that's Donna, Steve. I think you guys are the only ones who might be here in person. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mike Minion, you're here. So Mike, I am sorry. So somehow it is not, we've had a hard time with version control <laughs> and, and getting, getting uh, your information on there. So, um, well, you're going to be getting up and talking. Uh, well, that's true. I mean, if you guys would prefer uh, to just sit right here in front uh, until we... Uh, <laughs> All right, so, so what I'd like to do actually is I'm going to exit and we'll see how well this works. And I would like to invite uh, Bill Henshaw to start and we have his video. So this slide, because there are so many pictures is huge. Yep. Okay, and this is sharing, yep. Hello, everyone. My name is Bill Henshaw, and it's my pleasure today to give you a little overview of the Overture project that David Brown was instrumental in forming and shepherding. So I've known David a long time, and the story goes back to Caltech. I went to Caltech in 1981, and uh, I took a course from Heinz Kreis, uh, AMA 104, I think it was, and David was actually my TA for that course. So Heinz was a big proponent of these overset grids, also called composite grids or chimera grids. And so the overture story sort of begins here because actually uh, my, I worked on overset grids as part of my thesis. And then uh, I think David actually shared an office with Barbara Kreis, Heinz's wife, who developed the first uh, automatic overset grid generator, which was later taken up by me and then uh, Jeff Cheshire, who developed the, the comp grid grid generator. So the for some of us, of course, the pinnacle of our career is uh, getting a PhD from Caltech. And so you can see here, I have a signed copy, I'm sure very valuable, of David Brown's thesis, 1982. Wow. So the concrete story continued in Stockholm so that, in the early 90s. So um, David, was it, or maybe late 80s. David was at uh, Los Alamos. I was at uh, IBM Watson Research Center. And Jeff Cheshire was actually at Intel supercomputer, uh, Intel personal supercomputers working for Cleve Moeller of MATLAB fame. This was before I guess MATLAB, MATLAB was really just forming. So we went to uh, uh, KTH, Real Institute of Technology in Stockholm to work on Comfort. And there we met uh, young Anders Peterson who was a graduate student there who would later come to join, uh, join us in Livermore. So the Overture project per se, I think started in the early nineties. Uh, so David was there, I think in the CIC three uh, division with Jeff Salzman, Dan Quinlan, who was a young PhD. I think Dan Quinlan actually coined the term Overture. Other people there, I think at the time were Bill Ryder. There's a Mark Ryder, if you remember properly, Christy Brislon. Uh, later, I think Karen Powell came as a postdoc. And also Mike Minion and Jeff Hittinger made, made visits later on. So I joined Los Alamos 1994, also Jeff Cheshire. So this was the early days of Overture, early days of, of C++. So we had to deal with all the issues of C++, uh, which, was, which was lots of fun. So one of the uh, things the Overture project did well at Los Alamos, we went to the Oversecret Conference at Fort Walton Beach. Uh, Florida. We had lots of fun there. And uh, I mentioned this because David actually uh, helped organize later Overset Grid Conferences. First one was at uh, Livermore, sorry, at Los Alamos. Second one was, well, uh, nominally at Livermore, but it was actually held at uh, UC Davis. So then, uh, I think around 1996, uh, 
Steve Ashby was actually putting together the Center for Applied Scientific Computing at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Here's an old photo of Lawrence Livermore when it was known as the radiation, Lawrence Radiation Lab. So I think Steve Ashby uh, got together with uh, David at some conference. I don't know the full details, but then uh, some of us moved to Livermore. So uh, David moved, myself, uh, Dan Quinlan, and also we had a postdoc, uh, Brian Miller, who went to join CASC. So Steve Ashby was uh, big on brochures. So here's an early brochure for Overture. Uh, Anders Peterson was later to join the group. He, he helped with the Overture-based Rhapsody project. So here's a brochure for the Rhapsody. And also joining the team, we had uh, Kyle Chund. And we had, I think, a postdoc, Petri Fast, if I remember. So Overture was used for generating uh, nice figures for lots of different things. So here is an overture figure of incompressible flow flasks and buildings used in the companion report. Here is the what, s and plan, 2007, that David was involved with, showing a detonation hitting a number of moving cylinders. And here was a DOE report that David actually chaired, showing what I think is a very nice figure of uh, converging, shock converging past uh, a number of cylinders. So Overture has been used for uh, many DOA applications, ranging from very high speed flows, modeling of explosives, detonations, also incompressible flows, uh, conjugate heat transfer, and fluid, more recently we've been wor working on fluid structure interaction problems. Also, I think importantly, Overture has been used worldwide by research groups, including importantly graduate students. A number of graduate students have used Overture as part of their, their thesis. And we see lots of varied applications here of Overture being used. And there's a nice figure at the bottom, Mike Singer, who was at uh, Livermore, did some flows past the uh, blood clot filters. So Overture is still going strong. Recently, I was part of a DARPA Extreme program. Uh, we were part of a team, Actium team that was developing simulation tools for modeling metamaterials. And so we've been developing some uh, tools for elect dispersive electromagnetics and complex geometry. And this all, this all thanks to David, because back in SIDAC days, he organized a visit to Stanford Linear Accelerator to learn about some of the issues they were having with electromagnetics. And that spurred, started the development of the, of our, of the Maxwell solver that has now uh, progressed quite a bit since that time. Oh, I have a movie here too showing simulation, scattering off some materials. So, so with that, I'd like to end. And I would, at this point, I'd like to give my personal congratulations to David for a really fantastic career. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Saltzman, and it's my honor and privilege uh, to talk about David's trajectory uh, through Los Alamos National Laboratory. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm a retired applied mathematician doing some occasional consulting and independent work. Spent 17 years working at Los Alamos and nearly two decades working in the pharmaceutical industry uh, at both um, Merck Pharmaceuticals and AstraZeneca. The 17 years at Los Alamos is a slight superset of the time David was there from 1984 to 1998. So we should be golden uh, as far as covering the topics LANL, David Brown and LANL. You will learn more about me through my connections with David from the talk. Uh, this is now the time right now to uh, make the disclaimers. First, I have few records of my time at Los Alamos, partly because when I turned in my Q clearance, I also turned in all of my administrative records and any, any classified records, certainly. But the real reason was that uh, Hurricane uh, Sandy uh, put two feet of water in the basement in Princeton, and that pretty much ruined any records I've had of, uh, of Los Alamos that were unclassified and considered my own. Uh, second, as well as the lack of records, I think is my memory, which is not the greatest. Uh, to this end, I did talk with David and tried to do a reconstructive reminiscence. We had done this one time before in trying to figure out what we played on a 30th birthday concert in Los Alamos. We did remember that it was my birthday. Otherwise, it was pretty much a train wreck. So here we go. Um, 
Uh, this is a story really about uh, someone being at the right place at the right time with, and most importantly, the right qualifications. To that end, I will outline a portion of David's resume appropriate for David's time at Los Alamos. Uh, next, I, will, uh, I would like to paint a picture of Los Alamos during the, the uh, same interval, uh, during the same interval, and, and Lionel was on, uh, at this point, a pretty vibrant place, and it was diverse and there was balanced funding between energy research and the, the weapons program at that point. Uh, but time uh, constraints will really keep me focused just on numerical analysis and high performance computing. Uh, finally, so Jeff, I'll reiterate his resume again. Hello? Jeff, I just want to check. Are you advancing your slides because we're still seeing the title slide? That's correct. That's okay, fine. Okay, that's I just wanted I, to check. <laughs> I will, Thank you. I'll get there. I have a few slides. I really didn't, uh, I thought I put them in at the last minute just to, uh, uh, leaven some of the uh, talking head effect here. Um, anyway, um, finally, uh, uh, so I'll reiter reiterate a little bit is his uh, resume after the remarks about Los Alamos, and then uh, finally I'll conclude with a few personal remarks. Um, okay, so now we could do the next slide, right? There we go. Well, um, hang on, let me see if I could get rid of this. T here we go. All right. Oh my gosh, got it. All right, so the um, um, let's start off uh, with laying out, uh, out a timeline for David at Los Alamos and a bit before. Uh, I wasn't sure how the symposium was structured, so I'll start this timeline with his undergraduate and graduate education as his background is quite relevant. Um, David received both his bachelor's and master's degrees in physics as well as a master's focus in geophysics. One of the first conversations I had with David at Los Alamos was about why the wave equation and the problem of inverse scattering was important in geophysical applications. At Caltech, David switched to applied mathematics and was advised by Heinz Kreis, as well as um, a very well-known uh, numerical analyst, as uh, Bill has pointed out, recently moved from the uh, Quran Institute. This I knew well, since I had gone to NYU Quran specifically to study with Kreis and contemplated transfer to Caltech. Uh, this is where my memory really slips. Uh, David visited Courant while I was there, and we allegedly were in the same numerical analysis class taught by Olaf Vidland. Frankly, I have no recollection of this, and neither does David for that matter. Touche. Um, his thesis uh, is titled um, Solution Adaptive Mess Procedures for solution, uh, Numerical Solution of Singular Perturbation Problems. And uh, in addition, certainly to the overset uh, uh, um, grid work that uh, Bill has been talking about, there's lots of uh, foundational material that uh, uh, David put to good use in his career. Okay, so moving to, let's see here. Can I go to the next slide? Uh, let's see, here we go. Moving to Los Alamos, David ex extended his postdoctoral work through the acceptance of a very prestigious director's funded fellowship. I know this as I served on the postdoc committee. At practically every meeting, uh, we all developed an inferiority complex from examining uh, and ranking uh, these ridiculously qualified uh, students. His postdoc was in the computer research group within the computing division. Uh, I was already at Los Alamos in X division working on plasma physics and weapons research, and first met David through common interest in playing classical music uh, and in chamber music, uh, in chamber music groups and in the Los Alamos uh, Orchestra. Um, in 1986, he was hired on at Los Alamos uh, via the, um, um, the work of uh, Tom Manteuffel, Andy White, and Vance Faber, who created a position for David using block funding developed for numerical research within then what, what was called the computer research group. Uh, and that was within the, the computing division. I joined the group actually three years later after an eight year stint in the weapons program in 1989, primarily through David's urging and doing. I became David's team leader and was called the numerical analysis and parallel computing team in 1992. Um, in 1995, David became a team leader as I became the deputy group leader for what was now called Computing Information and Communications, CIC, group number three, still computer research, further turmoil for what uh, that year had me ended up uh, being the group leader for a new scientific computing group, CIC 19. And David continued to be a team leader for essentially the same 
uh, team of people. Um, this included two fellow speakers today, Bill Henshaw and Dan, Hen uh, Dan Quinlan. Uh, over his, his career at uh, Los Alamos, David worked and published in many areas, including compressible and incompressible flow, composite and adaptive grids, supporting scientific parallel software development, and more. Others, other speakers in the session have already talked a little bit in detail about his one, what he's done scientifically and administratively as he started work um, um, you know, as a, uh, in, in developing funding for uh, numerical analysis and uh, high-performance computing. So the next slide. Uh, so I was talking about being at the right place at the right time. Um, as I said in the introduction, I would love to describe what it was like 25 years ago in Los Alamos, uh, but there isn't time. Instead, I will simply focus on high-performance computing and numerical analysis at LANL and what really drove its evolution. Uh, HPC was hitting an inflection point in computer architecture that threatened to halt the climb along the Moore's Law Curve. High-performance computing was already institutionalized in many areas of the laboratory, including several fusion programs, weapons program, laser fusion, and magnetic fusion. Uh, there were many other important area HPC applications I'm leaving out under the DOE umbrella, but I'll stick with what I know. Okay. So the uh, what was this inflection point? The weapons program both at, at, at uh, Lanel and Livermore saw the first um, saw this first through time and cost of simply porting major codes between different architectures. By the 80s, most weapons in our arsenal had been designed with testing using codes on CDC 6600s and 7600s. CDC stars and early Cray machines were the latest and greatest uh, moving uh, CPU pipelining to vector processing within the CPU. The simula simulation codes were monster knowledge bases with many thousands of lines of codes and millions, millions of lines of comments and data. Porting codes strain the resources of the program as it is, uh, but uh, this time there was there was time when many codes um, and code sufferers uh, were uh, so pushed and extended that uh, really there was like a computer PTSD due to the uh, disastrous port to and from the CDC star machine. And not only was the port itself something that was uh, uh, had a big impact uh, on people's thinking, but uh, the the uh, errors in the ports, uh, you know, stuck around for many years to come in many ways, as it turned out. But code maintenance was only one of the pressures in the program. The total test ban was around the corner, leading to questions of whether these codes could still function as design tools without nuclear testing. Further, could they validate and verify the present stockpile into the future? And ultimately, could simulation be the keystone of stockpile stewardship today? Stockpiled stewardship is not just being able to uh, verify that the codes will, uh, the, the weapons will work as promised, but be able to do limited design and, re, um, and part replacement for these uh, particular devices. Um, <clears throat> so it was easy to say, see at this point in the 80s that, uh, and, and everybody involved saw this, that there was gonna be a heavy intellectual and capital investment uh, in numerical analysis and algorithm development in the complex coding environments to move these uh, codes uh, towards de novo computations. Scientific library development needed to be transformed from assembler level code specific optimization, optimization to a much more portable platform. The libraries and codes specifically needed to be transformed from scalar to parallel algorithms. C division was at the nexus of these challenges and the eventual landing point for a good fraction of this investment at Los Alamos. Putting this together, um, David's resume and his landing in C Division and the challenges faced by many HPC programs within Los Alamos, it was quite natural for David to purvey his background towards learning the business, that is learning about high performance computing, how numerical analysis was used, how the scientific libraries were used, and um, basically um, becoming a central figure in really developing programs for algorithm development, scientific libraries, and generally high-performance computing. Again, other speakers will supply more details of his specific scientific work, uh, learning the business as I said before, but David was already beginning to be engaged in program development at Los Alamos, as was um, mentioned by Laurie. So now you can see 
how he got from Los Alamos to where he is finishing at LBL. And truly, David was there at the right time and the right place. I left uh, Los Alamos in 1998, knowing that I had a talented and gifted successor. Uh, it was su surprising how he succeeded me. But, re uh, but really, in many ways, David also influenced my trajectory greatly, and he has remained a good friend over my entire career. David, thank you. Uh, hi, thank you. I am uh, Mike Minion. Lori did not have an old picture of me because I'm still young. <laughs> um, but as I put together these slides, I spent minutes yesterday doing it, I realized uh, I am old because some of these pictures are, are from a long time ago. I'm not going to do a lot of science today. I, I am a staff member at LBL, uh, but I've been on leave half time starting last May and full time leave for about the past eight months. So um, I've already forgotten basically everything. Um, oh, arrows. So it all started a long, long time ago. Uh, is Evans Hall that way now? I think on a bench behind Evans Hall, I just finished my third year of graduate uh, work and I was talking to Jamie Sethian. I don't know if Jamie's here. Hey, there he is. And he said, Minion, what are you gonna do this summer? And I said, I don't know. And he said, why don't you go work somewhere? And I said, okay, I didn't know how to do that. He said, talk to Alexander. Alexander Torrance, my, my advisor. So I went to his office and I said, Jamie says I should go work somewhere. And Alexander like went over and ruffled through some pieces of paper and he handed me a slip of paper with a name and a phone number on it. He said, call this guy. That guy was Jeff Saltzman, we just heard from. I called him up, it was a little bit awkward. Uh, yeah, my name's Mike Minion, I'm a... Uh, 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 and then I backed up and I said, oh, by the way, I got your number from Alexander Chorin. And he said, oh, are you a Chorin student? I said, yes. He said, can you start in June? So that's the way it worked back then. Um, so I went to Los Alamos uh, in the summer of 91. And I don't have any pictures from that summer. Remember, pictures used to be like a big thing to take. Um, but what I remember was it was really difficult to find a place to live. That was my burning memory of the summer. And David was really gracious. Oh, I got to Los Alamos and, and Jeff Saltzman introduced me to David and we started working together. Um, David was gracious and that summer, I think maybe three days, he let me stay at his house that he wasn't living in while I camped in the Jemez and squatted on Indian burial grounds the rest of the time. But um, I loved it so much I went back. And one of the things that happened um, while I was there is I learned a rock climb. This is the overlook. Um, White Rock, New Mexico, the back of the picture says 92, so I'll take that as true. Um, and that becomes a theme in my presentation. Uh, we did do some work eventually. I have proof. Um, this is a picture of the Connection Machine 2, which would be the next generation of machine after uh, Jeff's talk. Uh, they had a problem with it. They called David and I down, and uh, that's me pointing out where the, where the wire went wrong. And this is actually the CM5 which was the machine that uh, ended the CM line. <laughs> David, that is you, right? Yep. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> I thought it just might have been some guy who wandered into the uh, Center for Nonlinear Studies. But So this is a uh, 93. You can tell it's winter because I'm wearing flannel. Uh, I would go in the winters to ski, too cold to climb. And, um, and then in the summers I would climb. I eventually found the solution to my housing problem when the Saltzman family moved out of a box in their yard and allowed me to sleep there for the next three or four years. This was 95, um, Laurel and Rebecca. So I became their uh, itinerant college age son uh, during the summers. You kept um, this in the box. Is that a question? Oh, what? I believe you kicked us out to the box. You lived in the house. <laughs> Hey, dude, it's my truth today, okay? You had your chance. Um, so I eventually left Los Al or left Berkeley. I, I got a postdoc at NYU. Um, and this is the summer after my postdoc. I stopped by Santa Fe. Uh, a funny story about the postdoc was that I had originally planned on going to Los Alamos for my postdoc. David had offered me a position. I was quite excited about it. But uh, Marsha also offered me a job. I didn't know what to do. I called David and he said, oh, Los Alamos has rescinded their offer. So it's just another example where David really pushed my career in a particular direction. Not sure which kid this is, is this you? Okay. Uh, so yeah, so that was 97. 
um, we did do some work. So Lori alluded to this paper, I think, on, on the introductory slide. She misspelled my name, and actually this is not David's seminal paper, but it is about under-resolution of numerical uh, or incompressible flow. And it made the cover of JCP. It was my first paper. Back in the day, if you, got, if you made the cover, they sent you the actual journal. I still have it. It's a little bit weather beaten. Um, but what I really love about this is that the, the calculation here is wrong. That was kind of the whole point of the, of the paper was that you can use established methods and get completely unphysical res, uh, results. And so I thought that was kind of cool. We had a, a wrong, I thought this would happen every time I wrote a paper. In fact, it never happened again. Um, not to be uh, stopped there, we wrote a sequel to this in 96 where we um, tested six different numerical methods on the same problem and showed that they basically all give lousy results if you unresolve them enough. And um, one thing I wanted to point out about this slide is that at some point when we were sending the LaTeX back and forth, David switched the names and uh, made me the first author. Sorry, I'm choking up. He's got a box of Kleenexes. I'm gonna need it. Um, so my first paper, my first first authored paper, uh, all due to David. So then David left to go to Livermore. And when was that? 98, good, it's about then. I stopped going to uh, Los Alamos and I started going to Livermore, why not? And I don't have any pictures of Livermore, I, I don't know why, but this is Livermore in 96, um, <laughs> Livermore in 99, <laughs> you can see my hair is getting longer, and then Livermore in uh, 2000, 2001 maybe. I know because I met that woman in 2000, um, you can tell it must have been love because I am so dirty in that picture and she's still hugging me. Um, and I know that the other thing about this is Phil here. Not yet. No, I, I know that when we drove back to Berkeley from that trip, we went to Phil's house for a big food festival and because we hadn't eaten anything decent in 12 days and David was there and a bunch of people were there. But anyway, again, we did some work um, during all those climbing trips. This is the paper. This is my Google Scholar page. Uh, came out in 2001, Brown, Cortez, and Minion, and um, it has a thousand citations, which is by far the most that I've ever had, by far the most David ever had, and Ricardo too. I don't think any of my papers will ever pass it up, and it was David's last paper. So I think he's not disagreeing. So, um, and again, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure whose idea it was, but it certainly wouldn't have happened without David. As Jeff mentioned, um, David also plays music. They played, this is um, Jeff, who we just heard from, Laurel, his wife, and David, um, pr practicing for my wedding. These, uh, sorry. I didn't think this would be so hard. This is Brown, Cortez, and Minion. Uh, Margaret. Laurel and uh, Rebecca, Leslie Greengard, uh, Marsha, my wife, Catherine, who will be here later, you can meet her. And uh, that's Kathy Kozar, uh, Ricardo's partner. The whole Saltzman uh, clan, I got Ben in there. He hasn't appeared yet. Uh, the happy couple, you were married in 96, uh, I believe, leap day. Um, so I'll stop here. Uh, well, well, this is the last picture, but I just wanted to, to try and recap all this. Um, I mean, David has had a, um, a huge effect on my life. And um, uh, this is actually my last day of work, too. So I'm ending my career at LBL with David celebration. And um, all I can say is thank you. I can't say any more. Good, thank you very much. Uh, so I have no slides. This is all talking head as Jeff Salzman mentioned. Um, I met David Brown in 1986 when I gave a talk on load balancing for hypercube parallel architectures at Los Alamos. And counting backwards, it must have been roughly his fourth year at uh, Los Alamos, I guess. Uh, I remember he was really into bicycling, something that didn't rub off on me until much later. 
Uh, I had a summer internship at uh, Los Alamos with Vance Faber in 1987. And uh, Vance had a horse riding accident, which uh, as I started my internship, uh, he was okay. But as a result, uh, I was pretty much on my own for the whole summer. And uh, I got to work on the problem that he gave me. And uh, as a result, I got to know all the other staff on the floor and surrounding buildings and had a wonderful time working in the classified area of the lab because I had managed to get my clearance uh, before starting my internship, something that was possible probably only back then uh, to get a clearance so fast. Uh, because I had rented a house for the summer, I held movie nights for other interns. And David actually uh, joined one of those, uh, at least one. Uh, and so that was kind of fun, but he also had get togethers for students and staff at his house in Los Alamos, at least a few times. What I remember a lot of is how, uh, how much David was involved with students and what sort of impact he had on students. So I'll make a few more comments about that also. Uh, this was all my first exposure to uh, DOE lab. And afterwards, uh, it was the only place I ever wanted to work. That was what impact he, uh, he and the lab had on me. Uh, I started grad school the uh, fall after my uh, summer internship at Los Alamos. Uh, I visited David and Jeff Salzman at, at LANL as often as I could uh, while in grad school uh, through 1993. So the whole point was to, if I showed up often enough, maybe I'd you know, get an opportunity to uh, maybe work there. Uh, and uh, I ended up accepting a postdoc from them uh, and I was very, very happy. Uh, the final uh, commitment to Los Alamos was pretty simple though. Uh, in the last year of my PhD, David Brown arranged funding to support teaching a class at the, uh, uh, within the applied math group at the University of Colorado at Denver that coincidentally was exactly on my summer internship project. Uh, the university, of course, accepted the funding because that's how it works. And uh, I was funded to teach the class. And that was a very clever way in which David supported me then uh, and very appreciated. I learned a lot from that. And I've done the same trick myself with the students that I've come across who I wanted to come back and work for us. At LANL, I discovered the Overset Grid technology. Uh, that had been supported through a complex Fortran library by Bill Henshaw, uh, who, was at I, who was then at IBM. Once Bill came to uh, Los Alamos, I worked with Bill and David on what became the Overture Project. Collectively, we and others uh, advanced it from a Fortran library that was difficult to use to a C++ object-oriented uh, open source framework that was much easier to use and accessible to a wider audience. David helped me get my first LDRD at uh, Los Alamos, uh, specific to adaptive mesh refinement and elliptic solvers, which was my thesis. Uh, in the process of making Overture easier to use, uh, Rose uh, was in fact developed as an idea for a specialized performance translator for Overture C++ code. LANL was where I expected I would stay forever. Uh, until Jeff Salzman demonstrated that one could actually leave LANL. And then David and Bill and I decided to move to Livermore in 1998. It, was a, it would be a better home for the overture work that we were doing. Well, we didn't start it, but coincidentally, a lot of staff started leaving, after, leaving LANL after that. Overture became a significant framework at Livermore and was once referred to as the best kept secret at LANL. Uh, Rose was just a compiler project on the side for the first few years, uh, but it received support from David, who had been a part, who, who had made it a part of what it is I was able to work on for the ASCII project in the first few years at Livermore. Uh, David suggested Rose to Steve Ashby as a uh, possible LDRD project. After presenting it as an LDRD project, I was asked to go present it to Fred Johnson at DOE Oscar. And that's how Rose and I became part of Fred's group of funded CS research projects and people. Uh, and that was uh, a lot of fun for many years. Uh, David was directly engaged with Oscar and helped me understand how DOE funding worked early on, critical, critical to living in an Oscar funded world. David helped steer the Rose project toward its first LDRD in cybersecurity in 2004. 
and later our binary analysis work in 2006. David eventually moved to LBL, uh, but helped me get Rose started. And for that, I and many others are deeply uh, appreciative. Uh, as you can guess, Rose is still a project today. Uh, on a multi-dimensional, on a multi-generational note, I discovered yesterday that David had had a significant role in calming the nerves of a recent hire at LBL during their interview. I know this because she told her father, who is, happens to be somebody that I've worked with for 20 years and somebody who I hired to the Rose team five years ago. Uh, so David has had a lot of effect on, on students, myself also. Rose funding is now, has grown steadily over the last 20 plus years as a compiler uh, research project uh, and is now a eight to $10 million a year project at Livermore with 14 full-time staff and definitely keeps me off the streets. Uh, both the source code aspects and the binary ask work in Rose are still well funded today. And we are all deeply grateful to David for his support in Rose's formative years. When I think of David, I think of the person who has helped many students. He helped me finish school. He helped me start a, dear, a career in DOE. He showed me how to run research projects, manage people, expectations. And he helped us start the Rose Project, which is the longest uh, lasting DOE project with which I will ever be actively associated. David, thank you very much. Okay, our last sort of technical talk for, for this part is uh, Kyle Chan. And so Kyle, uh, we can now see you and hear you, so go ahead. Yeah, oh, oh thank you. Um, I, I thought I'd have more time to recover from Michael Minion's talk. I got my, my tissue box here because uh, it, uh, David was very important to me both professionally and personally as well. I, I don't have any slides, um, but I would like to just share maybe a couple anecdotes and uh, relate how, how David's uh, really impacted um, 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 my career and actually my personal development as well. So let's see, I, I joined um, Livermore in 97, uh, fresh out of a master's degree in aeronautical engineering. In fact, I didn't really even know what Lawrence Livermore National Lab did in those days when I accepted the job. And uh, maybe a little bit over a year later, I started working with Overture who uh that, that arrived in um in 98 and um it's interesting i i uh recently moved jobs as well so david was really instrumental in in helping me transition from a work environment where uh, i wasn't very happy to overture which was which has been one of the most supportive and intellectually stimulating projects i've ever worked on i, I have very fond memories of of those days and it's really wonderful seeing all the folks that I either work directly with, uh, you know who you are, Bill, Dan, I'm sure Anders is here somewhere, and David, of course, uh, and then all the wonderful people that I met as part of the Overture Project. And all of that uh, is because of David's support uh, of this young staff member moving on to this um, really great team. So uh, in those early days, I was doing mesh generation, um, flow solver development, along uh, as part of um, all of the things that Overture was doing. Um, and the environment there was particularly, I, I think that, that David fostered there, uh, both collegial and supportive, uh, but also really interesting all the time. Um, and also giving opportunities to youngsters like me uh, to do things like uh, help out writing proposals or um, developing input to proposals and things like that. Uh, in fact, one of the most, the best, um, comments I ever had on a performance appraisal was written by, by David. I remember this verbatim because in those days, our performance appraisals were many pages long and uh, included quotes from, from our customers. And since I was Matrix, David was one of my customers. And he put in uh, to my performance appraisal that Kyle is willing to waste time for funding. And that was, uh, I think, one of the best comments I've ever had on a performance appraisal. And not one I don't think I could get away with, uh, putting into a performance appraisal now, but uh, it, it certainly uh, served me well and has been a good, uh, good laugh over the years. Um, but I think one of the other things that has really helped me in my career uh, and hopefully others is that um, on the Overture Project and with David, uh, we always took the work seriously, um, but 
uh, maybe not ourselves. So like watching David give a de deadpan presentation to our managers and talking about uh, the, uh, the overblown flow solver we were developing, uh, completely tongue in cheek name, but uh, not really entirely sure whether the joke was landing or not, but it was definitely landing with folks like uh, uh, Dan and Bill and me. Well, Bill, I, think, I don't remember who named it, but uh, just watching David deliver that to uh, managers and sponsors was just, just really great. Um, and there's many, many examples like that. Later, uh, as I became more of a, as my career developed, um, I'd say I tried to emulate David a lot in terms of how, um, excuse me one moment, I'm actually, I have to, sorry, that was one of my kids. Um, <laughs> working at home. But uh, David really was an inspiration for uh, how I, I manage projects later. Um, and uh, if I was a good mentor to, 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 to new people that came on board, um, people like David and Bill and, and Dan and the Overture sort of theme was what I tried to carry forward. And uh, I still do today. And uh, so David was there at the beginning of my career uh, at Livermore, really instrumental in actually keeping me at Livermore and, and keeping me happy and being supportive through some really rough times in the early aughts. And um, most of you probably don't know, but I, I, uh, I just took a job uh, outside of the lab. So here I am at the end of my career at Livermore after about 25 years, um, something that David uh, really helped start. And um, taking all of that with me to the next phase of, of my career. So um, I just wanna thank you, David, for everything, all the support you've given me through the years. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think there's a day that goes by um, professionally or often personally where I don't think about those days on Overture. And, um, oh boy, here I go. Um, I just wanna thank you. And I also wanna thank you for having Giving me the opportunity to be here to thank you like this. I wish I could be there in person, but um, thank you all and thank you, Overture. So at this point, we're going to conclude the Livermore Lanel days with uh, Steve Ashby and Donna Crawford. So they're both here in person. So I'm going to invite Steve to come on up. I think this is working, right? Oh, do you want to use this one? Can we, and are you going to walk around a little bit? Can we switch it to the stage? Oh, you hear me all right? Okay. So first, Lori, thank you very much for the invitation. And David, thank you for so many years. Uh, and uh, it's been too long since we've seen each other, but uh, thank you for this opportunity to reminisce. So we've heard about David's technical career and um, you saw many of those people were dressed a little less formally. And it reminds me of a, of a story about, you know, someone's coming to you and they're in, in jeans and a polo, you can be assured they're doing the work. If someone's in a coat and tie, they're probably talking about someone else's work. Uh, and if they're in a suit, they're lying about someone else's work. Uh, so I did bring a suit today, so I will try to tell the truth. But as Jeff uh, noted, memories do sometimes slip and decades merge. But uh, I had the pleasure of being at Los Alamos as a graduate student. I don't know if we actually met when I was a a student, uh, David saying we did. Um, but, but I'm gonna go back to the first time I really recall you professionally. What I'm gonna talk about is some really uh, important time. Uh, you heard Cass mentioned earlier, and it was something that uh, a lot of people were really instrumental in creating. And David is one of those people. I'm also starting to choke up a little bit as I go back on some of these things. But I remember the first time I met David in that context was 1988. And it was this group, uh, it was an overblown group, is what I, I heard about. Um, this overture group, uh, it, a whole group of people wanted to possibly come and join Cask at Livermore. And so David and I, I believe we'd had some telephone conversations. We arranged for uh, an interview visit. But David said, we have to keep this quiet. All right, we can't let me know. My current management doesn't know I'm thinking about moving on. And this is an important story I'm gonna tell you because I've, I've told this story many, many times about the impossibility of keeping secrets when you're doing these things. So if anybody's out there, you're looking, going for an interview, just assume it's gonna be known, so be upfront about it. Because David's there, we had a really nice conversation at the second floor of the building, 451, we're getting ready to go for lunch. Do you remember where I'm going with the story, David? 
You don't. Well, you're about to find out. Um, you'll, I'm sure you'll remember it, or maybe you purged it. But we're going out. So we have this group, and it's supposed to be all in the QT, and we're going to lunch, and we're walking down the stairs, and another individual is walking up the stairs. This individual is Ann Hayes. Ann Hayes was David's boss at Los Alamos at this time. We pause <laughs> mid stairwell. Ann looks at David and says, I thought you were on vacation. <laughs> so I never knew whether it was our persuasive skills that convinced David to join Livermore or Ann uh, deciding your fate. But in any case, that was one of the first memories I've always told people that story uh, and the importance of, of uh, being wary of who you're to run into on these ways. So this was an important part because when we're growing cast and starting that, uh, David was one of the very early senior technical leaders that we hired in the organization. CASC was uh, founded in 1996, and David, as you heard, joined in 1998. It was really important because we were growing rapidly at the time, and we had a lot of postdocs and young people coming on board, but we needed some more people to provide that seasoned technical leadership and mentorship. People could understand what it's like to have been there and provide that mentoring to a lot of the new young staff. And so this is my polite way of saying it's nice to have some old folks around, uh, David. But um, David was really key, uh, key to what we were doing at that time in terms of helping to bring an established project with quite a reputation that complemented other things going on at the laboratory at the time. Uh, and also then, as you've heard so eloquently from many people who are directly with him, but I think more broadly than those on the Overture team, it was all who interacted with David benefited from his calm demeanor, his dry sense of humor, and his great advice. And I can't think of how many people you've influenced uh, throughout your career. I can just imagine the ones you did in that time there and helped us really to grow that organization. It's one of the proud points of my life. And so I wanted to thank you for what you did in that area. I you also heard allusion to David's role in program development. Um, uh, I guess I wouldn't say you're wasting time going after funding, but uh, maybe that's how some view it. But there's two stories I want to tell you about, because um, I think it talks to having the vision of where you want to go and the determination to get there and, some, and being clever about how you want to get to that outcome. So the first one is, you know, we're going along, everything's going reasonably well, organizations, you know, flourishing. Uh, and then we all can remember what happened with 9-11. Uh, one of the consequences of that, the Department of Homeland Security was stood up. Now, barely, uh, uh, David, this barely rec uh, credits one reference in your resume, because we looked it up, just noted it. But I suspect we spent a lot more hours than that one bullet would, would signify. So uh, Department of Homeland Security was standing up. And one of the things when it was created is that a fair amount of the Oscar funding that was at Livermore had been identified to move over to that new department. And so we were then contacted and asked, what are we gonna to do to redirect this funding, do things relevant to the Department of Homeland Security? Uh, I think a question that still persists to this day, uh, trying to sort that out with the department, but David was key in working with many people at the lab as we were trying to figure out what is the appropriate kind of math and computer science program for this new Department of Homeland Security? And there's a lot of stories best told perhaps over dinner after a little alcohol is involved. But I have to say, David was instrumental in helping us really try to, to find de novo, a research program for that, pro, uh, for that department. And I'll just be honest here, I think it was some of the most frustrating times uh, we've had. It's the only time I ever lost my cool with the sponsor. But uh, David was constantly providing that. And I remember one of the things that we can say, you talk about lasting legacies, is that although there was a lot of turns and twists in that, one of the things that persists is uh, we help them think about this new thing called data science. Uh, we were talking about that then. And one of the things we did with them is help create a competition for some institutes in data science. And I believe if they may still be going in some form uh, to this day. And it shows David's ability to go in, work with the customer and the stakeholders understand what their needs are and translate that into something that was intellectually engaging for the performers. Uh, and we did that throughout some of the things we're working on, but also 
with those universities. And it gets to another point, which is David's ability to engage academia and pull them into the laboratory environment uh, and recognize the culture differences there and to be successful so that everyone felt it was a value. And I think that was uh, really key in getting a good quality result for the Department of Homeland Security there. Uh, the other thing though, is that I think you'll hear about it uh, later maybe from John and others, but uh, we had this task then of looking at how do we rebuild the Oscar funding? Uh, so the good news was that government's inefficient and incompetent at times, all right? Um, and what happened there is that Homeland Security meant to take all our math money, but the budget tables were inaccurate, so they only took half. Um, and so no, we did not point out the mistake to them. Um, but we, I do remember Walt Polanski, I'm sure you remember Walt. Um, David and I were sitting there trying to figure out how we deal with this. We got a bunch of people uncovered. We know what's gonna happen with DHS and all that. And uh, I remember Walt giving some of the best advice. He says, when you've been stabbed in the back, we're not gonna question how you pull the knife out. And I think it was key, David's focus on taking care of those people who are funded, whose funding was affected of making sure that they were taken care of. And that's a commitment that he's made to staff members and students throughout his career. Uh, but we're then looking at how do we rebuild this program because we wanted a balanced portfolio. And so we decided to paraphrase Kyle just to waste some more time going after funding uh, opportunities. This is when SIDAC was finally starting to emerge. And I think we'll probably hear more about SIDAC. So I'll only tell you one story here, but we're thinking about the strategy of doing this. And this gets to David's you know, insights into how do you craft a winning proposal or portfolio ideas. And it's, it's clever, it gave rise to what we call, after the fact, the Avis strategy on SIDAC. I think you probably remember that very well. At that time, Office of Science was standing up a very big new program and wanted to fund all these uh, research centers. And David and I were sitting there with several other people trying to strategize how should we position ourselves to go after these opportunities because the staff that David uh, was leading, especially in applied math and other areas were very well qualified, but we recognized we had this challenge that we were at a weapons lab. It was an office of science call. And that, you know, we had a lot of our PI saying, well, I could lead this or we could lead that. But David was a student recognizing this is an office of science call. They're gonna expect these centers to be led by office of science labs. And so what we put together was a strategy, and I think it's really David's creation, where we partnered extensively, and you heard that, the collaborations, hallmark of David Brown, collaborated extensively with others, where we were number two on a number of proposals. And if I'm not mistaken, all seven of the seven proposals we were on were funded. We led none of them, but then Walt Polanski comes back after all the dust settles, and he's talking to David and me, and he says, I noticed that Livermore wasn't leading any of these things, which is surprising to us. When we total up the total dollars amount, no other lab had more funding out of SIDEC than Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And David and I smiled knowingly and just went on. And, and, uh, and that's the kind of leadership from a program management perspective you need from somebody who's been there, understands the eagerness of the PI to write those proposals, wants to have that lead, but saying it's better you get funded all right, and be able to do that important work. And sometimes you have to make those compromises. So that's something I think that David imparted to a lot of people learning how to do that and craft an overall response to something like that. And these are the kind of things that we had to worry about and occasionally wear ties to talk about, but it's something when you're trying to build an organization and take care of people, having folks like David who had that relationship who understood, you know, with the sponsor, who understood what was going on and could give that advice is important. So I just wanna close with one last uh, comment, which is throughout this, what you've seen is, and you heard about is a lot of you know, people getting choked up, rightfully so, over the mentoring they've gotten from David. Uh, I've certainly benefited from that. But I think in particular, it's the young people and the students and the postdocs. Um, I began my career as a, a, a graduate intern in the labs uh, and got to know them. And it's only because I had a, a different set of mentors. I didn't have the fortune of being mentored by David that I stuck with it and uh, had a very successful career in the labs. And I can't think of how many people are in the computational science community who owe that to David Brown 
because of his dedication and commitment to the people. Whenever you're having a funding problem, and we have them occasionally, the commitment was you don't mess with the students. You make sure they're covered. They should not know there's a funding problem. We just take care of the students. You help the postdocs be successful. And David always had them front and center. And they also then worked with our existing staff. So David, I wanna thank you for all that you did. CAST is a very special place uh, because of your efforts. It has a special place in my heart for uh, time of my career. And we couldn't have done it without we, what you did, uh, the people you brought, the leadership you brought, and the uh, caring that you brought. So thank you very much for all you've done. Thank you. Great, thank you, Steve. And we'll conclude this panel with Donna Crawford. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think I, does, does this work? Test, 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 all right, excellent. Well, hello, David. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> oh, it won't be that bad, I promise. <laughs> um, it's lovely to be here. Um, this is a momentous occasion. I've, I've really enjoyed everything I've heard already. It takes me back and thank you very much, Lori, for inviting me. I'm going to give a, um, a high level management overview of David's time at Livermore Lab, some of which you've already heard, but maybe you'll see how some of the pieces fit, maybe not. Um, but it, it just, it's all about David, right? So I was the Associate Director of Computation at Livermore, um, ALD in the parlance here, and I held that position from 2001 into 2016. So as such, David was already at the lab when I arrived, and he was the section leader for simulation frameworks in CASC. Yeah, as you've heard, the Center for Applied Mathematics, Applied Scientific Computing. Now, most people take for granted today that the right way to organize math, computer science, and computational science is to have a group that applies computational research to critical national security problems in the case of Livermore Lab, but other computational disciplines at other institutions. But this was novel when CASC was formed. And David was recruited into CASC because he knew how to put pieces together. So on almost immediately, he became the group leader for computational mathematics. Uh, you already heard some about CASC. I thought we might hear a little bit more, but we still might later. Um, and David's role there from Steve. Um, but what I wanna say is that before joining Livermore, I, I knew the name David Brown. We had never met, but I knew, uh, I knew about CASC and I knew about David because first of all, CASC's mission, again, this is a mission oriented lab. And so it's a little different. The idea was to advance the science, but support the mission. And you had to do these two things simultaneously. And you did this and still do by immersing people into the applications groups. And again, this was novel back then. And um, now everybody thinks this is naturally the way to do it. And of course, this ensures the relevance and impact of the research on important programmatic objectives. And it's also important though, to bring in academic research those external ties, the new blood, the new ideas to make sure that you're doing the very best science pass possible. So even though I had this very large directorate when I came to the lab, you know, I paid close attention to CASC. And that means I met David as soon as I arrived. Now, as I said, I knew your name because you were leading the Overture Project, which was the toolkit for solving par partial differential equations on structured overlapping and grids, but we'd never met. And it was that experience with Overture, of course, that made you the natural leader of the section leader for simulation frameworks in CASC. All right, so shortly after I re, um, came to the lab, I reorganized, it's what all ALDs do, right? Um, and so I didn't break up CASC, CASC was too valuable, but I combined it with other organizational units focused on applications and I promoted Steve to this new organization called Computing Applications and Research, or CAR, the CAR department. And I'd like to take credit for David moving up to be the CAR Associate Department Head for Science and Technology, but alas, I can't. That was Steve. This is a nice little, you know, talk about get the gang back together. This is a nice little group. It's really great to be here. So 
in CAR, David took on more and more programmatic work. You've heard some about that with DHS and with um, SIDAC and Oscar. And then in 2009, so I mean, he stayed with in CAR even after Steve left, but in 2009, David broadened his purview even further and came up to join my office. So he was a member of several LDRD review committees you know, from 99 to 04. I, I looked at your, your resume, thank you. And his job was to ensure that the LDRD projects included computer science, mathematics, and, and computer simulations. This was not always the case at a physics lab. And so, and then later David became the, um, the computation directed LDRD portfolio manager. And it was under David that the number of LDRD projects grew in our directorate. So thank you very much, because it's very important underpinning for the mission at the laboratory. Um, he was my deputy associate director for S&T from 2009 to 2011. And in this role, he synthesized the various funding mechanisms, and we had many, to pr produce strategies for our important S&T thrusts, having first participated in the discussions about what should those thrusts be. And then he provided the most organized and cogent views of what was going on, what progress was being made and where we needed to go next. In other words, he was invaluable. As you heard earlier, he was the research manager for Oscar uh, in CAR, uh, CAR in 2002 to 2003, but later he was the principal point of contact at Livermore for Oscar from 2007 to 2011 meaning it was David who knew what was going on at Oscar and David who sold the remote ideas to Oscar. I hope the Oscar folks believe that. I do. Um, and he was instrumental in establishing Livermore as a leader within the Oscar program, which Steve did talk about, and driving a, the dramatic growth in Livermore's Oscar portfolio. So it was a, during a trip with David to Germantown to meet Oscar leadership and this was even before he came up to my office, that I learned of David's exquisite taste in food and wine. And I'm really surprised no one has mentioned that yet. <laughs> Later, I learned he also enjoyed fine art and fine music, being classically trained in viola and piano and performing chamber music when he got the chance. And we did hear a little bit about that. So all of that makes this next story particularly amusing. The lab was hosting an Oscar program manager, came for the lab for a programmatic review of his portfolio. And this man, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, and maybe it was Polanski, but I'm not quite sure it, you'll remember. Okay. <laughs> he had several allergies, making it difficult to take him out to dinner. So was it Polanski? Okay. Um, anyway, so we decided I would host the dinner party at my house. And you know, Court David, several PIs all came to the house. I think you were there too, Steve. But my stipulation was that everybody had to entertain after dinner. So, you know, you had to do tell a joke, uh, do a magic trick, play the piano, do something to entertain the group. So, of course, I thought David would have chosen to to play a beautiful classical piece on the piano. I happen to have a grand piano, but instead, he and I did a piano duet and sang the words to the talking horse, Mr. Ed. <laughs> Obviously, you know, a horse is a horse, of course, of course, and no one can talk to his horse's horse, and I can do that whole thing. But until just now, I couldn't remember who the program manager was, but for some reason, I can remember the words to that song. Anyway, David, if I have the story wrong, you can correct the record, or you can just play along, because I think it's a pretty good story. <laughs> Sadly, David left Livermore in 2011, and it was our loss for all the reasons that I've already stated and you've heard already, and of course, Berkeley's gain. Um, I remember another member of our associate director's team, Trish Dam Kroger, uh, she bought you Birkenstocks when you left Livermore to make sure you would fit in at Berkeley. So, I mean, these are, these are important things to know about David, right? Luckily, he and I stayed in touch after he left Livermore Lab. And throughout his career, as you have heard so much about, he was and is particularly enthusiastic about promoting opportunities for young up, up and comers. And as you know, he is the founding member of the steering committee and current PI for the DOE Computational Science Graduate Fellowship Program, which you will hear about in the next panel. And of course, I was very much aware of CSGF and the importance of it at Livermore Lab, 
um, and friends with Jim Coronas and, and so on. And I knew of David's key role in that, or that program. It, it was, this is another personal story. It was one of, at one of the CSGI PI meetings where the labs get to stand up there with their poster and talk about why the students, the fellows should come to my laboratory in that case for their practicum as opposed to another. And David noticed that I was standing funny. Long story made sure, I won't go into it. David is observant and he's caring. And thanks to him, I avoided back surgery and had a very successful hip replacement instead. So um, I still see David because after I retired from Livermore, he put me on the Krell board so that I could um, stay engaged with CSGF. And I still see David at the CSGF PI meetings on a yearly basis. Um, I could go on, but I will wrap up. Um, but I, I have to end this way. I know this is all about David's career, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention David was a devoted husband and father. I have many pictures of David and Margaret. I saw you earlier, Margaret, there you are. And, um, at um, special laboratory events, especially director's balls. We had some fun back then. And there were numerous conversations with David about his sons. He's very proud of you, Will. And I don't know, did Gordon end up very proud of you boys. I know you're not boys, you're men now, but sorry, I, I knew him when he was talking about his boys. Anyway, thank you, David, for your many, many contributions and for making life a little sweeter. Lori asked us all to say, when we think of David, what do you think of? And I think of generosity of spirit, exquisite scholarship. I do think of fine food and excellent wine and beautiful music. Thank you. All right, thank you, Donna. Thank you. All right, so I think we should go ahead and take a seventh inning stretch. Well, the next panel comes down. I, we don't have a break until after the next panel. There are four speakers in the next panel. I'd like to invite those speakers to come down to the front. You, we, I, I agree, it's probably easier if you're facing um, the speaker. So, and we have Barb Helland online. Is Barb still here? I don't see her, but we do have recorded remarks for Barb. So Jim, you're you're gonna start us off. Yeah, yeah, you want to pull that mic? Absolutely. Well, I don't have a, I don't have any size. Uh, well, uh, you know, my my first comment is to thank the organizers for. Uh, uh, inviting me to give this um, to help celebrate uh, David's professional career. It's a it's a pleasure. Uh, I've known him for well, 30 years now. Uh, it's a pretty long time. And um, the relationship that we, um, in terms of my, my relationship with David, David was forged back 30 years ago uh, by uh, the uh, Computational Science Graduate Fellowship Program. And I want to tell a little bit about it. Okay. Um, the, uh, uh, and uh, for those who don't know anything about the Computational Science Graduate Fellowship Program, especially something that per, is such a big object in his career, I wanna do about two or three minute description of what uh, this was all about. So if you go back to 1989 and 90, there was a lot of discussion within the HPC community, uh, the DOE HPC community, that the labs are having a lot of difficulty identifying and recruiting people who could use HPC uh, platforms in their work. Um, the, 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 there's um, a, a big a big issue here had that the labs had interdisciplinary science and engineering missions and uh, computing was becoming a larger and larger important uh, playing a larger importance in the, in that work. Um, and the other thing is that this was a rapidly um, evolving high performance computing environment at the time. And I, um, for some reason, I think of you when I, I hear th there was this great uh, article in the New York Times in 1991, May 6th, I, I went to find it. it was called the attack of the killer micros. And we were in the process, the, com the community was in the process of completely changing the paradigm for how you would do computing. And so it made it even more urgent to, to try and develop a next generation. And the general sense at the time was that the academic institutions, they weren't really prepared or equipped to um, comprehensively train graduate students in this you know, interdisciplinary uh, work. So in the fall of 1990, 
um, Gary Johnson, who uh, I uh, was at the uh, in at, at DOE head, headquarters, uh, convened a meeting uh, with the idea that the goal of the meeting was to discuss the creation of a four-year graduate fellowship program. Um, and the goal of the program was to train the next generation of scientists who would use HPC technologies in their work. Um, the, the, the general thing, one of the general uh, issues here was um, that, uh, how, what are you gonna name it or how do you wanna describe it? And the description of this um, program basically fell out of a Venn diagram that showed the intersection of mathematics, computer science, and applied and uh, uh, application science. So where those things, three things intersected, that's what we wanted to call computational science. And that laid the, the frame, framework for what we would, um, how we would define the program elements uh, of this program. Um, it, it, it focused on academic breadth by including required in it, in, in, required interdisciplinary program of study and a practicum experience at a DOE laboratory. The, the practicum goal was to provide a broadening uh, experience, you know, um, enhance the educational experience for the fellows by providing exposure to research in a national lab. And there was a, a, there was a, a goal here too, that we wanted to, this is a DOE program. It would be nice to get these fellows into a DOE environment and they might become um, uh, they might fall in love with and want to you know, go work there when they were done. Orao, uh, the other thing was this had to do a fast start. So uh, you're, you're competing with other uh, fellowship programs. So it was designed to be a financially lucrative award. And at the start, it also addressed uh, a, a desire to attract a diverse pool of applicants, which was had been a, a really difficult problem for a long time. Many of the things that I was involved in. So uh, Orao was initially selected to administer the program. I think Barb will get into that change. And then um, uh, the selection of the first cohort happened at a gym, in a gymnasium at Florida State University in 1991. And uh, there were uh, 21 new fellows selected. So that's the short story. So this is a, a program that's really aimed at trying to get, tr train the next generation of people who will be using all these uh, platforms that are rapidly evolving over time. I hope that later on in, in this session that there'll be some other discussions about David's uh, contributions to things like the management of the program uh, and um, his, his, uh, how he engaged in order to have, help battle keeping the program alive when there were competing um, uh, priorities inside the Office of Science because there were, there were ups and downs over this 30 years, as you can imagine. But for me, I want to focus on David's leadership as a fellow member of the CSGF steering committee. I'm on, um, there were three of us that are still around that started this program back in, uh, at that time. And David is one and Bob Boyd is the other. So um, we were the youngsters. That's uh, hard, hard to believe. I, I'm glad I don't have any pictures um, and in this initiative. And but still, we were, we were still appointed uh, by, to the CSGF Advisory Committee, so we were early members of the CSGF Advisory Committee by Jim Cronus, who was a professor of mathematics. He was at Ames Lab, and he was the principal investigator for the effort. Uh, the committee was small, five to six people or so, uh, but Jim used this committee very, very actively in the sense that we were engaged in every detail in terms of steering uh, the development and, and basically fleshing out the direction of the program and, and being there to apply mid-course correction so that it would succeed in, in, the, uh, in the overall goal. Uh, from the start with this, David was, and these are, these are impressions over a 30 year period. So I'm, I'm, gonna, so I'm rolling them up, but from the very start, he was very actively involved in, and he was a very constructive member of that leadership team. Um, and it was really important at that time because over the next, over that first decade, the program changed almost continuously from year to year. I think Barb's going to talk about this as well, with the goal of trying to make sure that we were uh, identifying the very best in a very, very ex extremely competitive and talented pool of applicants for the uh, for this award. This kind of critiquing and refinement of the program and the application and the selection process 
these are things that David was absolutely excellent at. And um, he was a principal contributor to all this, to the solutions that were required. Uh, his suggestions were always insightful, thoughtful, and, it, oh, and a, a real indicator that he understood uh, how CSGF was actually working. And that meant he understood the people who we were supporting in, in the program and, and what, what was maybe holding them back and not providing the most um, beneficial environment for the, their success. So, um, so as, as I said, we were so actively involved, they eventually just changed the name of the advisory committee to a, a steering committee. And um, uh, the steering committees, would, we would interact, we'd direct, oftentimes interface directly with fellows as it was necessary. Um, anytime there was a short fuse issue to resolve, David was there, immediately there. Um, he, he would have constructive solution, and he'd also have an analysis of whether there was a way to avoid this problem down, down the future. And that would be all codified in the form in the way that the, the program would work. Um, David never hesitated to directly engage fellows in a supportive, as a supportive mentor. And this has come up already. He was a, a very a strong mentoring um, uh, force within the program. Uh, and you knew that this was real because um, when you would go to the annual meeting, you would see the the, all the fellows who would want to, to chat with him because he, he, he would reach out to these folks and, um, uh, and, and, uh, and he, they, they knew who he was and they sought him when uh, uh, we were in the same place. Uh, he consistently demonstrated leadership at this time in identifying computational science experts for the selection process, and that was important uh, for doing this job right, and speakers at the annual meeting. So uh, in my mind, he was a highly visible contributor to all of the programmatic components of the fellowship as it evolved over that 30-year period. Uh, one of the standing jokes uh, in, uh, in the, on the steering committee uh, was that laboratory practicum preferences seemed to follow David around initially at LANL, then at Lawrence Livermore, and then finally at LBL uh, as one data point. So in other words, wherever data went, David went, there was a spike in practicums <laughs> that for, at that institution. Uh, as one data point, Berkeley shows the largest number of completed practicums between 1992 and 2020. So um, that's, um, uh, David won't, Take, he won't go with causation on the base on correlation, but it is a, a, or a number of us noticed it. Um, so the, uh, over the life of the fellowship, uh, the disciplinary range of new fellows has run significantly, right? We started with more mature uh, applications that were things like computational fluid dynamics, computational physics. And then as time went on, we moved into areas now where we're doing biology, high performance uh, computing applied to biological problems, bioengineering, machine learning, quantum computing. Uh, this is great for us on the steering committee to help stretch us into you know, these intellectually uh, interesting areas that we're now seeing work done in. And, and over the last few years, the Oscar program office and the steering committee uh, realized that um, the, the, that there was real importance to enabling technologies um, for uh, uh, traditional scientific investigations. So we created a new track. David was a major player in making this happen. Uh, the track is focused on mathematics and computer science, where these fellows will get their PhDs in math or computer science, but will be focused on contributions to advancing the effectiveness of HPC um, uh, environments. So once again, again, D David was a central player in defining and executing this track. Uh, uh, and uh, I think since it's been, we, we have been paired for working on the selection process for this track, just to make sure that we're, we're kind of getting the, the right, uh, the, the right candidates. So as a final example of uh, his leadership, uh, with the passing of Jim Coronas, who was the PI in 2017, uh, the program found itself without scientific um, leadership that Jim had provided. So in 2019, David stepped up along with Jeff Hittinger, who's here and going to speak in a few minutes, 
to take on the role of principal investigator for CSGF. David has a day job, by the way, and but he was willing to step in and and uh, as does Jeff uh, to get step in and take on, I think, a very complex um, uh, uh, role in, in keeping this program alive. I feel it's hard to overstate the importance of uh, uh, of continuity and th this multi-decadal experience that he brought to that transition, so, which meant it made for a smooth continuation of uh, the CSGF fellowship, you know, and, and that's one of the longest running programs in the Department of Energy. Uh, and in my assessment, really, of, of how to write this down, you know, he's a leader. And he's at the same time, the consummate team player. He, he knows how to be collaborative. He knows how to um, work with others. And, um, but at the same time, he's uh, uh, going to be an essential contributor to anything. And he was an essential contributor to the success of this program as it stands right now. So I can't finish without um, um, a, a few personal observations. Uh, one of the things I've looked forward to these last few decades is going out to dinner with David and Bob Boyd. <clears throat> okay, I, Donna brought this up. Um, there's always involved fine dining experiences and extremely fine and expensive wine. <laughs> uh, you know, these are the moments as I was maturing that I understood that per diem was intended to cover the tip for dinner. <laughs> it was a, <laughs> that was about where it went. So uh, most of these were really memorable experiences, that, uh, uh, except there was this one that I can't remember the experience, but I do remember what happened next. And I know there were other things, but we were, um, I think, out to dinner. And um, I, I know David remembers this now because I reminded him last night. We were in Washington, D.C. I think we were outside the district and coming back into the district in order to uh, go back to the hotel. And as we were driving back, uh, we had a blowout and the right front tire blew out. And uh, so we had to immediately get off the highway. And this is like where you get off the highway and you go down and the highway's above you and you're in a warehouse district, there does, <laughs> which you start to realize I'm not in a really good or particularly good part of town. So <laughs> the memory I have of this is uh, watching David and Bob trying to change that tire like a pit crew at the Indianapolis 500. <laughs> and I, we're, because and my my role was to, to I, I was my role I played was to watch for trouble, and I don't know what we would have done if we had seen trouble coming, but but uh, but uh, that's uh, that was just what it's always been a, uh, just grand, a grand time. It's the treat when uh, you're going out and doing uh, you know real work to have an opportunity to sort of relax with David and enjoy life a little bit. So you've been a great colleague. And a, and a great friend over all these years. Uh, congratulations on making it to retirement. Um, uh, you, you've earned it. And I think you can look back on a career that leaves a very long and distinguished legacy. And uh, this is just one of those pieces. So thank you, David. So, so our next contribution is an online video, I believe, from Barb Helen. Good afternoon, all, and I'm sorry that I can't be there in person today, but I did want to share my best wishes and remarks on uh, David Brown and, and this celebration of his exemplary career. I've known David in many roles over the years. Uh, certainly, I met him uh, through the Computational Science Graduate Fellowship, and I'll come back to that in a, a bit, but I've known him as a peer uh, when I was working with Jim Coronas in the Applied Math Program at Ames Lab, and we would attend uh, Office of Science program, contact, or points of contact meeting uh, with DOE management to discuss the applied math program. And I also uh, have known him since I've come to work uh, at DOE headquarters at, in the Advanced Scientific Computing Research Office, first as a program manager and more recently as the associate director. David has been a key uh, player, partner uh, in the Office of Science in Oscar and its predecessor. Uh, the Mathematical and Information uh, and Computer Sciences Division, uh, or mixed division, uh, and he, he, since its inception, he uh, was always there and, and ready to support 
the Office of Science programs and uh, program managers here. But let me go back and talk about the computational science and where I met David uh, to begin with. This was in 1992. Uh, the management at DOE at that time, uh, I believe it was Gary Johnson, along with Ed Oliver, approached my boss, Jim Coronas, uh, to take over the administration and uh, management of the Computational Science Graduate Fellowship. When it was started, the fellowship was started, it was run by another program uh, within um, office uh, within DOE. And unfortunately, they had very uh, restrictive requirements on what they did on, when they ran fellowships and what components could be in and how a fellowship could be run. David and others on uh, the first selection committee realized that this, that the computational science at that time was very unique and that, that trying to fit it in uh, to the components that the other program office uh, was requiring just wasn't going to work. And that's when, uh, the, at that time, the mix office uh, approached Jim Coronas to take over the running of the fellowship. And so it was transferred to Ames Lab. And, uh, and, and at that time, I oversaw it uh, for the program. And uh, I probably met, met David at the first uh, meeting of the selection committee, which became uh, the advisory committee for the program. So we could talk about what worked and what didn't work. And what didn't work at that time was the fact that one of the components of the uh, program was to actually uh, select or approve universities to be part of the program. Uh, so you would select the universities and you would also select students and hopefully students would go to those universities. We, we, we realized this was too restrictive, that we didn't want to have to restrict where the fellows went to school. But it, once we got rid of the requirement of, of approving universities, then we had the dilemma. How do we know that the, the student, depending on, you know, where, no matter where they went, were getting a computational science education? Thus, the program of study is born. And we spent many years crafting what it meant to be a core computer science or a core comp applied math course. And over the course of the years, that's changed just as curriculum and technology has changed. Certainly there were years when we were questioning what in the heck is machine learning, but now that's integral to what we do. And, you know, is it computer science? Is it, you know, domain science? And, and there, and I think the, uh, actually overseeing the effort and, and caring for the program and, and, and making sure that, that we keep the standards of what computational science is, has been integral into maintaining uh, the quality of fellows that come out of the program. And I think a lot of that goes to David and his partners on the steering committee. And, and, and certainly, not only did we have to add the program of study, we had to add the dreaded three questions. The three questions that were going to determine what a applicant was going to do with computational science and how they were going to use high performance computing in their research. So, and, and I think today, I mean, we were in Smith that those three questions every year that I was part of the program. And I think they're still re, 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 word smithing those program, those questions today. Uh, just to get it so that, that you know, we're trying to get the, fel the applicants to actually think about what they would use with this technology. And one of the, the benefits of uh, having a number of people uh, uh, on the steering committee, uh, a diverse set of people, is the fact that we could anticipate when, um, you know, the needs of different di disciplines for computational science, certainly. In the early years, we were focused on computational fluid dynamics and programs that use those and disciplines that use those um, codes uh, in, in, in use the computers. And as we went out, we've added programs in computational biology. Like I mentioned already uh, machine learning and uh, AI, uh, and certainly that's been impactful. And now more and more to all of the disciplines uh, that computational science graduate fellowship supports. 
And we're also looking towards the future. I mean, how is quantum information science going to play? Again, it's the insight that David and uh, others on the steering committee have given to the management of the fellowship that helps us move in these new directions. The other thing, you know, um, early on, uh, I mentioned David played many roles in the fellowship, and certainly he's been on uh, the steering and advisory committee. He has also served on I, I countless selection committee uh, teams, uh, pre-review, pre, you know, reviewing the applications uh, with teams alone, uh, and and then after a long day of reviews um, and discussion, uh, setting on uh, the team to actually craft those special paragraphs that go back to the uh, selected applicants to help them select maybe a different applied math course or a different computer science course. It's really going to help them along the way in their career. And I think it's that care uh, that helps, again, helps us uh, maintain the quality of the fellows coming out of the program. Uh, I do remember one memorable uh, selection committee meeting where we were supposed to have it in Monterey, California, but it got moved to DC because we wanted management uh, from the mix office to actually come to the selection committee to see just how strong a candidate pool we have those last days of the selection committee meeting, because at that time management was trying to cut the program. Uh, they would only say, you know, saving $3 million in 1995 wasn't important to the program. But we, even though nobody from headquarters came to that meeting and we did three days meeting and one day, um, we were managed to award, I think, five to six fellowships that year and continue to build support for the fellowship through not only the department, but I, I think we have strong support in Congress as well. Uh, and part of a lot of that goes to David for his tireless works behind the scenes, working with the DOE program manager at the time, Fred House, to convince him that we needed to main, keep this fellowship and keep it strong. And speaking of Fred, uh, I also want to uh, cite another role that David's been in a role with is after Fred passed away and we established the Fred House Scholar, David was instrumental in developing the process for selecting that scholar and, and conducting the reviews every year and actually introducing uh, the scholar at the annual meeting. David helped us plan the annual meetings and I think he actually was instrumental in one that we, the time that we actually had the meeting on the West Coast at Berkeley and Livermore. Uh, I, it, one of the few times it was out of the DC area, but, um, it, you know, the other thing I haven't talked about and where I always remember, will always remember David Brown and the fellowship and not just for the special meet, special expensive meals that he planned in New York as part of the selection committee meetings. But I'll remember the David Brown factor. You could always tell what lab David Brown was working at because that's where the most practicum, where the fellows were taking the most practicum. It started at Los Alamos. We tracked it to Livermore. And it seemed just a little bit of it when he went to Berkeley. But the, the legacy that David leaves is at each of these facilities is it's not only they had fellows coming in to do practicums there, but there's a number of CSGF fellows actually working at those labs and at all the labs across uh, the DOE complex. And, and I want to thank David for his hard and tireless work on making the fellowship of what it is today. And I know that in the future, he, as long as he's involved and others are involved and, and the people that he's mentored who are coming up behind him will maintain that uh, quality that we've built into the program since the very beginning. David, congratulations on your retirement and I wish you all the best in the future. And then, yes, the promise slides for, for our panelists. All from, you know, 10 years ago or more, I hope. <laughs> Shelly, that was the only picture of you I could find. I'm not sure what that dates.
Uh, uh, you can use this or lighter. Light water. All right. Can you hear that? Good. Okay. All right. I'm I'm horrified to think that I'm more of a manager now because I'm I don't have the tie on. But, but I also don't have slides and, and chose to speak from a piece of paper. So um, thank you uh, for the organizers for inviting me. Um, David has played, well, he's been in my career, my entire career. And so it's a pleasure to, to speak about the impacts he's made. Um, as Lori said, I uh, received the fellowship, the, the CSGF fellowship in 1996. Um, so as you can tell, the process wasn't as rigorous back then. But they did get better. So um, now, nowadays, it's quite, quite the uh, group of candidates that we see, just amazing students uh, who we are fortunate enough to um, sponsor and help shape their careers. And David has played a major role in that. Uh, so I started back in the days when, as was mentioned, the fellowship was all about computational fluid dynamics, magnetohydrodynamics, you know, just solving PDEs on grids back when it was just the simple stuff. Um, I ended up, uh, we, so part of the program is you do a practical. We go to the, one of the DOE labs for summer. And um, they wouldn't let me get out of that because I had spent a summer at NASA, uh, Langley once, the summer before in 96. But they said, no, you have to come to a DOE lab. And I'm really glad they made me go because then I really discovered what the DOE labs were about. And uh, that was my, that, Definitely changed my career trajectory at that point. I did my practicum at Los Alamos, and that's when I actually met David. He apparently already knew who I was. In retrospect, I'm not sure that I made that choice, that maybe I was targeted. But um, I spent the summer in CIC 19 working with many of the people who uh, spoke earlier, um, got to work on Overture, uh, sat in the office with Karen Powell. Um, I was actually working with Rob, Rob Lowry at the time, but the Overture team took me under their wing and we went out to lunch every Friday. We would go for Chinese, I guess. Um, and I remember when I uh, finished that summer, David had sat me down to ask me kind of what, what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go. And that was a, a moment where I hadn't really thought about it too much, but I, I caused me to be uh, introspective about what I wanted. Um, I gave a presentation to the group I had been adding some, I, I came from the shot capturing school, not the Christ school. Um, so I, I've been adding some uh, object-oriented shot capturing uh, software into the Overture code, uh, which David politely asked for after I gave my presentation. I don't know if it was because he wanted to have it or whether it was gonna be a case example of how not to do this. Now, now that I know how to write object-oriented programming better, I know that that is not the way to write that code, but um, it was nice enough to, to ask. So fast forward a few more years, I'm sitting in the CFD lab at, Mich at Michigan in a cold February day and the phone rings. The phone never rings in the CFD lab. And it's David calling me. How he knew I was in the CFD lab, I don't know. Um, but he said, hey, when are you gonna be done? So I gave him the standard grad student answer, six months. Uh, he said, great, I have someone who you, you need to talk to. So the very next day, Xavier Graithar was in the CFD lab at Michigan. And two weeks later, I was interviewing for it in CASC. Um, before I knew it, I had a job <laughs> and I had to hurry up and get my degree done. Um, so David obviously played a role there. Um, you know, he, he seems to know where there are opportunities, know where there are people and know how to match those throughout his time and all of his roles. Uh, so that's how I ended up. So I, I ended up at Livermore because of the practicum I did at Los Alamos, uh, thanks to David. Um, not, C not CSGF related, but as Donna said, uh, David took over responsibility for the LDRD program, and he actually gave, helped me get my first LDRD, which interestingly was also adaptive mesh refinement. In this case, it was in, in higher dimensional phase space for plasma physics, but uh, you seem to have a, a pattern of that. Um, after he left to go to Berkeley, which was admittedly a big loss for us at Livermore, uh, I got invited to serve on the steering, uh, the screening committee, selection committee. We have too many committees. I had been serving on the screen, screening committee. These are the, the first passes of, the, of all the applications. We get about 400 and we can only give out, in that time it was about 20. 
Uh, so there's a screening process and then there's the selection process. And the selection process is really intensive. Um, there's a couple rounds, you're reading these very long applications, they've got these essays, they've got multiple letters. Um, there's several rounds and then you end up in the final meeting, you've got a week, you're coming down from 80 applications, trying to get it down to 40 so that you can all get together in a room and argue about which of, the, which of that 40 you're gonna give uh, the fellowship to. And David, you know, in those, in those days was active in all of that. And it's a lot of work. It was, it's a real marathon reading all those applications. And David was right there as part of the selection team, reading all those applications, engaging in the, in the discussion. Um, so that was, that was an honor and a privilege to get promoted from, from screening to selection. I really enjoyed that. Um, soon thereafter, they asked me to come and serve on the steering committee, which was great, but it was, it marked the beginning of some bumpy times for the fellowship. Um, the first bumpy thing was a decision by the steering committee that we were going to change the eligibility requirements so that second year grad students would no longer be eligible. And there were a variety of reasons for this. We really wanted to impact the, the fellows uh, research trajectory sooner. Um, we had a limitation on sort of the number of fellowships we could give out and the scale of the number of fellowships we could review. But there were a good number of us in the uh, alumni pool who had gotten into the fellowship in our second year and weren't so happy about this. So it was an interesting dynamic. Um, but throughout all of that, I always saw that, you know, David was always, he's always very thoughtful, um, compassionate, um, but very principled in, in how he thinks about things. And he is very much a strategic thinker. Uh, the next big disruption then was in about 2014, 2015, when I think it was OSTP decided that it would be a great idea if all of the fellowships were just under NSF. And purposely, the CSGF was not an NSF fellowship. I mean, NSF is a wonderful program, but they give out the fellowship and you're kind of on your own. And CSGF is really much more about providing a training that you don't find in academia. There aren't really computational science departments. There are a few, a few now, but at the time there were not. Um, and so we have all these various program elements, not to make the fellows do more, more work, but to help them learn the differences between all these different fields, learn how they all come together and be those uh, critical points in the, the teams that they, they serve on to uh, develop the you know, computational science tools that we need, which are interdisciplinary uh, activities. Um, so there was a lot of work going on in that to try and save the program. And we had some really rocky years there where the, the program was zeroed out in the budget. Um, I don't know everything that David did, but I, I know that through all of his connections, his connections with SIAM, you know, he spends time up on the hill you know, there was a community response to that. It wasn't just CSGF. There was a larger community response in the applied mathematics community in particular about this is not a good idea, do not do this. And eventually we got it saved. And now CSGF is stronger than it's ever been. We have uh, significant more funding. We're up to 34, 33, I'm close, off by one. That's good enough. Um, so some other things, I, I had the honor of serving on the House Committee with David and about five years ago, I guess he felt it was time to take the training wheels off and let me take over as the chair. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and he did also see through this, this new change of including this Mass CS track and that was years in the making. That wasn't just something that happened overnight. We did notice that as the program grew, we shifted from those early days when I joined, it was much more about uh, modeling nanomaterials and bioinformatics. And then it quickly became computational bio and, and a lot of density functional theory became very dominant in the program. These days we've obviously moved into machine learning and, and, and quantum computing. Um, but through that, we saw that sort of the math and CS component kind of dropped off. And one of the reasons for that is you always needed to have a strong scientific application uh, when you applied for the, for the fellowship. And that was harder for the math and CS students to do. And so we made a decision and we successfully made the argument we needed to broaden the scope so that students who were developing those broadly applicable technologies, the enabling technologies, would have a better chance at succeeding through the process. And it's a different track just for the application, but once they're in the program, we treat them the same 
as the rest of the fellows. And that's been great. We've, we've had a significant increase in the number of math computer scientists in the program. Um, and another aspect of, of, that, of the program, the way it was designed, and you know, it's just thanks to David and, and Jim and Jim Hack and, and Bob Voigt. As Barb alluded to, computational science has continued to grow and change since the fellowship was founded. And they were very wise that they did not write down a set of criteria that was a checkbox. This is how you get into the program. This is how you succeed. Um, I know I, I had conversations with, with Cronus about this, that he didn't want to see the program ossify. He wanted it to be able to grow and change as computational science as a field evolved. So the philosophy was you put people on that steering committee, on the selection committee, who have, they can think beyond their institution, they can think beyond their field, they can look out and see what's going on in the community, see the trends, and really trust them to make the right decisions about where to drive the program, as opposed to just have a checkbox. And David is a very important part of that. And I've always seen that in, in what David has done, um, sitting through all these steering committee meetings, all of the arguments every year about how to change the questions in the application. I think we only changed like six words this year, so we're getting better. Eventually, by the time I retire, we will have the questions, right? No? Okay. Um, so I think I will, I'm almost to the end here. I mean, we're, we're up to a program now that has had 458 fellows in the time that it's been running. Uh, 66 of those are at the labs, which is, I think, a great testament to the quality of the program. Actually, I'm proud to say most of them are at Livermore in terms of the lab that has the majority. Um, I've also interacted, and in, in the next panel we'll talk about this, um, I've had the pleasure of interacting with David now on more of a peer-to-peer -peer level. Uh, I became the Oscar Point contact at Livermore and the director of the Center for Applied Scientific Computing back in 2018. And as part of that, I took over uh, Lori's role on the CRL CRLC, which we'll hear about a little later. Um, and that's really been eye-opening and educational for me to see David's deep understanding of how DOE and the government works, his intuitive nature with regard to what the right approaches should be to really affect change. Um, as Kyle said, I try my best to emulate how you lead and how you think about things, because it's a wonderful example. You're so thoughtful in your decisions. You're so careful, considerate of others. Um, you really are a remarkable role model for everyone who has had the opportunity uh, to work with you. These days, I'm blessed to work as the co-PI with David. We get to approve all of the requests to change programs of study and um, deal with the issues as they come up with the fellows. And uh, I'm looking forward to him having more time to respond to those because my inbox is too full. But uh, we have very thoughtful discussions about those um, to try to make sure that what the changes the, the students are making are actually in their best interest. Um, and I think that just continues to speak that even at this point, he's still affecting that next generation. David, I do not think it is an overstatement to say you probably have had more impact on the DOE's applied math and computer science community and programs than any other person. And thank you for that. Thank you for all of your service. Thank you personally for being such a great role model. All right, Shelly, we have one final speaker before our break. So Shelly, you wanna come on up? I don't remember, do you have slides or no? No slides. Okay, okay. So yeah, now for something completely different. Um, I'm not affiliated with a lab or a university. I didn't work with, with David directly. Um, I didn't go to school with David. Um, so my relationship with David is a little bit different. I have props too, David, so. Okay, so I, I responded to the questions that Lori has sent out. Um, a lot of, of what I have to say has been said in one way or another, but um, I'm going to speak first to the David Brown factor that Barb alluded to. So I met David probably 10 years ago. 
Um, I've been at Crowell for 22 years and I started to get more involved in the leadership of the, the program maybe eight years ago. But when I first started, I was behind the scenes and we would help set up the lab poster sessions at the program review. And we were at the Washington Court Hotel, which many of you probably remember. And they had a two tiered meeting space that we would use and the lab poster session would be in there. And um, we had, at that time, I think David was at Livermore, we had his set up at the top of the stairs. And Jim Cronus came over to me and he said, you're gonna have to move that. And I said, why, we have them all spaced out. And he said, it will block the stairs. Everybody will come to see David and it will block the stairs. So you're gonna have to move his display. So we did, and Jim was right, as always. So that was the first time that I met David, um, peripherally. Uh, so currently we work to get, excuse me, together on the CSGF program. Um, I manage the operational piece at Krell. And um, so David gives a lot of time to the fellowship, as you've heard. And while Krell provides management of the day-to-day -day aspects, um, David and Jeff guide uh, the technical piece. And um, the effect that uh, the, the partnership that we have has had on the fellowship, I think can be seen by the success and the growth. Um, I think that uh, working with David, as you've heard, uh, David is a great mentor. And I think in my career, David has become somewhat of a mentor to me. So I will be speaking kind of from that point of view a little bit. Um, so under David's guidance, the flexibility that the fellowship has shown really speaks to his ability, I think as Jeff was mentioning, to what's coming, what needs to happen, what needs to change. And Jim Cronus was the king of that. Um, he kind of could predict what the fellowship needed before the fellowship knew. And I think part of that was this, this group that uh, Jim ran around with, which was Jim Hack and David and Bob Waite. And so I think the four of them had a tremendous impact on the fellowship. Uh, David's dedication to the training and mentorship of the fellows, as we've heard, I think all over the place, is very impactful. He's also been a resource and an advocate for Krell, comp for Krell uh, computational science communication over the years. So another thing we do at Krell is computational science communication. And although um, David's a soft-spoken guy, I think because he's pretty thoughtful, he's always the first one there to lend his voice if we need him in a, in a communication piece or to speak on something. Um, clearly, us at Crowell, uh, we are not in the position to be able to do that, but David is the first to stand up and say, let me help you. Let me do that. Uh, let me support you. And that has been... Uh, invaluable to Krell. Uh, whoops, sorry. Um, David is one of the godfathers of the program and he has ensured the program's success and viability for the long haul. The current makeup of the steering committee um, includes the folks you've, you've heard about, Jim and Bob and David, but also Jeff and other alumni and other people that we bring on board. And all of them have been so fortunate to learn from David and in the ways that Jeff spoke to, his thoughtfulness, um, his ability to really think through a problem. Sometimes he gets super quiet and you don't know what's going on and he just kind of stares and you think, oh no, did I offend David? But he's just so thoughtful. And then when he speaks, he speaks with intent. So he has positioned the current steering committee um, to certainly move on. And I think that would be one of his legacies um, will be the training and implementation of all of the processes he has developed over the years uh, to ensure the fellowship is successful, that he's now shown to other people to make sure the fellowship is successful. So um, the thing that Lori asked us to think about too was when I think about David, I think about um, the first thing that comes to mind. So we've heard about the dinners and I think we've heard a little bit about the wine, but there's a lot of wine. There's a lot of wine stories. 
Um, and I'm not going to stand up here and tell a bunch. But um, so when I asked the Krell staff, I, I went around and asked the Krell staff, when you think about David, what do you think about? And wine was, was one of the things. And a story when we were at a steering committee meeting, dinner, there was very few of us, I think, there. But uh, David, we always defer to David to select the wine, of course. So David selects the wine. Of course, we needed a second bottle. So we get a second bottle. Well, there was something funky with that. And David, of course, uh, mentioned it. Well, the sommelier comes running out and the assistant and all the people. And we were all just tickled with how tickled David was that he had spotted this funky wine <laughs> and sent it back. And, um, you know, they kept, so then they were so deferential. They kept bringing him wine and, um, <laughs> you know, sir. And so it was really lovely. But I think that's a good example of, you know, and I always have to tell David, we have a budget for wine. The bottles can only be X because his taste is so good. So not that we don't want that one. So wine was one of the things that came up uh, with the crawl staff. Thoughtfulness was another one. Um, I think when, uh, when things started to go a little sideways at Krell, when Jim Cronus got sick and then passed away, um, David was one of the first people to stand up and say, how can I help you? And if you know Jim Cronus, which I know many of you did, um, Jim Cronus trusted no one. So the fact that when he became sick, he said to me, trust David, lean into David. And I've been able to do that. Now I'm getting teary and I have blown him, known him at least. Anyway, so that's something I think about that, you know, David's this light, this mentorship light that even us at Krell, you know, we can lean into that. Um, one of the other things we like to, to do at Krell, it's kind of like a bingo card. So when we see David places or we see pictures of David, is he wearing CSGF gear? <laughs> right? Because Dave is like the biggest brand ambassador. So we're always super excited when we see David show up on a Zoom CSGF. And we actually, sometimes we take pictures of this, of anybody. If we're like, this person's wearing CSGF gear. So um, my show and tell, not really show and tell, but because David has been so amazing and all the things, we got him new gear from, for CSGF. So this is the contemporary gear for David. And um, we hope to see you sporting this around some more. I should get you something Krell to, to, to send you out in. Um, so I'm not, I think I'm standing between everybody in the bathroom. So, uh, so finally, yes, so wine, thoughtfulness, mentorship. Um, one of the other things I also really am thankful for, um, for David is he's always been honest, I think with me. And so even when conversations have been hard, um, when the outcomes may be less than desirable, I think Dave has always been honest and I appreciate that. So with that, I will, I will stop talking. Maybe we can get David to model this at dinner. That would be awesome. um, but thank you, David, for all that you have done for Crowell. All right, thank you.